everyone's here at the moment. So. Right, so good morning everybody. So this is the 15,000 um, video meeting for the Ipswich and East Coast Beekeepers Association. And um, now we, we're going over straight over to Paul White. You don't want to hear me at all um, on the extracting honey. So here we go. Let me just flip the camera and we see this gorgeous extracting honey. Um, Let's set that buff for a moment. Okay. Uh, oh, it's waiting. Waiting for our technical assistant to help us. Well, I'll start the preamble so that uh, we can get things sorted out in the background as well. Today, my hope is that I'll give you an introduction to extraction. Uh, my aim is really to go through the process of how to clear the bees from the super, how to decide what to extract, and then we'll take through the process and we'll literally do a, a practical hands-on session of doing the extraction and some of the points that uh, you might have to remember. I'll stop every so often to take questions because at the moment I believe most of you are muted so we don't get all the feedback, but we will stage it and give you a chance to ask questions. If you have a question, Write it down in front of you while you're having your cup of coffee so that you can actually remember to ask it when we stop the question. And then if there are any extra points we need to cover, we can go back and do a bit more extraction or show an uncapping or question about wax or filtering of honey. My aim is it should take around 45 minutes, uh, but uh, we can be a little bit more flexible if need be. So, Sam, are you okay with everything now? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, I'll okay. do that one. He just thought he had the last bits and pieces, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the process of your honey on the bees in the hive. Now, I've got a super sitting here, I've got two super sitting here. How do you know when to extract in the year? The question. Um, that's up to you and the bees. You won't really know, of course. You take the honey from the supers, and the aim will be that the honey in the frame should be about 80% capped. What do I mean by capped? Well, if I take a frame out of the super and look, this one here, I'll bring it close to you, is Close. about 50% capped. Now, the capping is the white layer of wax over the top of the honeycomb. Now, you could say, well, that's not a cat. Is it ready for extraction? And one way to check it is to literally turn it at 90 degrees and shake it. If any liquid fries out of it, that honey is not right. It's got too much water in it. And so the question would be, you shouldn't really be extracting that honey. This one, solid as a rock, the bees just haven't got to capping it yet. And I, with a bit of experience, know that this one's fine because I will be checking my honey anyway at the end for the moisture content. And I have a process by which I can get more moisture off the honey. And we'll talk more about that later. When you've got your supers and they're, of course, for the bees, if you've only got one or two hives, it might be a simple process of literally lifting the super off, putting it to one side, lifting up each frame in turn, and with a comb brush, or with a good shake, shake the bees off and put the, super, the frames back in the super. And then you can walk further up the garden and do it again to shake the bees off, and then finally take the super and put it into wherever you're going to do your extraction. Yeah, this is what I do, but um, I'm getting very rapidly bored of this technique. <laughs> One of the things I would observe is if you've taken the honey and the super off, don't leave it anywhere where the bees can get to it, because you will have thousands of bees in your kitchen, in your garage, in your <laughs> shed, in no time at all. It's at that point or other, and you'll never then the people can in the big really So don't do that. Oh, the sorry. second process you can do, of course, is if you've got the crown board and you've wondered what are these little white things that fit in the feet holes. Oh, well, they're clearing, they're supposed to be escaped. 
Oh, and yeah. they work as a one-way valve. The plastic should slide off them, and there's two different plastic splits that you can use. I'll have the man look at it and see for yourself. And that basically restricts the bees from going through. Go on, demonstrate it. The bee, I can get out that way, but I can't get back in. Well done. Now these will clog up in no time at all, so don't leave them on your board if you've got them. Only put them on when you're using the board's appearance. But they're slow. If you put one of those on and you've got two or three supers to clear, you'll find that it won't work very effectively. It's too slow. And even after two or three days, you'll still have these in the super. But it does work. Of course, that's a method of doing it. And then one thing that you do have to do there as well is to give them space underneath that. You board. do indeed. Yeah. If you've got a clear board or a, a portably escape on crown board, if you don't put an empty super underneath, or sometimes you have to put two on if you're clearing lots of supers above, the bees will not go down. There's not enough space. The problem with this, though, is that there isn't much room underneath. There's only one bee space. There is such a thing as a clearer board. And as soon as I found these, I love them. They work really well. They're either round or rhombus shaped at the back. There is a triple bees width underneath so that you can actually get lots of bees coming underneath and a very large hole here. Bees go down, they come out and sit on the grid on the other side and they're almost talking to the bees on top. And with one of these you can clear a stack of three supers in six to twelve hours. And in fact this is what I do. I, I'm relaxed about it. I'll put this un over the top of an empty super, the stack of supers above, and this morning I took two supers off one of the hive, and this, the, the bees were virtually empty. I had about six or seven bees left, and I don't even have to put a super on to go and pick up the supers. So clear boards if you want to, uh, portably escape on crown boards if you want to, or a comb brush or a good shaving. That is your supers clear. Right then. What happens next? Well, you need some tools. You can use an old knife, a bread knife, an actual knife that's been designed for uncapping, an uncapping knife. And this one has got serrated edges on one side and it's got a curve on it. It makes it easier to cut, and cut the wax cappings off. You can use an uncapping fork. He says dropping wax on the floor. Which will be a tradition. That literally uncapped and will be shut later. No, there's such a thing as an uncapping rake. Okay, and that one there we'll show you later is also very effective. I use these three tools. You could use a on Barry, you use heat gun. Give me a theory for your usage. On the heat gun, I find it's great. I've, I've been uh, using them and capping still before uh, with a bread knife, basically, being taken off. And you end up with a lot of um, wax and honey mix yeah. that you then have to process afterwards. Yeah. So, the advantage of a heat gun for me is that if definitely covered all the coats, um, particularly the ones with white. White capping so the so it doesn't stick the top strip to the honey, and it and the the heat gun immediately um, gets the honey, gets the cappings off. Um, there's very little waste, very very little mess. But okay, everybody their own choice. Um, try this one. 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 Try this that's why I choose the mechanical methods. So everybody's going to find their own method of doing the thing. The uncapping, you will have to uncap into something. I have a couple of uh, stainless steel uncapping trays that I don't that, that I have uh, that sit in a sink, the same as the sink. That's where my capping drop. Once that fills up, you need to put them somewhere. And you really need something with a grid on them so you can catch the honey that drops off the capping. I reckon that about 10% of my honey comes off it. And so don't waste it or pass it back to the bees. Capture it and let it drip out. So you need something to capture it, either a sieve. Um, I've got 
and I'll show you later an actual uh, settling tank with a grid on, and I'll leave that to settle uh, the honey coming off it. You're right here at the bottom? Are we, are we okay? You don't want to move to anybody, I'll ask the question. Hello? It's a Hello? I'll be back. What's happened, uh, Sam? I can't be seen. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're back. We're back. We lost something, did we? There was a glitch. There was a glitch in the matrix. Okay, well, the first question is, are there any questions to what I've said or what you've actually heard? And have you heard everything I've said? <laughs> Reception is a bit difficult at times. No, no, but, um, no, no, no. Yeah, I've got the gist on the whole. <laughs> Thank you. How long would you keep your board for cleaning the bees on the hive? I didn't catch that. How long? One day? 12 hours? Uh, okay. Yeah, if I put... Yeah, if I put the board on, what I can do is I put it on uh, in the afternoon and I will take the supers off in the morning the next day and then put the clearer boards on the next set of hives in the afternoon so I, I work for a cycle and so it, it's usually uh, as a, uh, a 6 to 12 hour period where they clear if I'm using clearer boards if I use portable at least and for shaking uh, you, you can do it there and then and the porter sorry okay. uh... We didn't hear. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to now move to. Oh, you didn't hear. Sorry? Are you here? So the porter, the porter bees, how long did you stay? Sorry. Uh, porter bee escape, I said 24 hours a day. Because it takes a day for the bees to clear through a porter bee escape. Yes, thank you. Okay. Right then, I'm going to go slower and we'll do a little bit of extraction. So, the first thing to do, you'll probably need a hive tool to break any comb or brace comb on the frame in the box. And you literally will break it out and lift out the frame. I look at it and it, I know it's ready to I'm going to first of all use the uncapping fork to show you how the uncapping fork works. And what we do is where there is capping, I slide the fork along the top and just lift the fork, lifting off the capping. And then I use the bottom of the frame to pull the cappings off. It's very quick and literally I can work along a frame that's not fully capped like that. I've lifted the frames off and that's one side done. If you find the frame is too heavy for you, because you do tend to build up strength in your arm by holding up four heavy supers of honey, you can rest the frame on the uncapping tray and hold it at the top and do the same thing. Exactly the same on the other side, I have capping, and I'm going to do the same thing. If I had a fork, it's going to take a long time to do, if you use the fork on its own. So I'm going to the second tool I had, which is the rake, and literally I can run the rake, what you said to be easy, and run it all the way down the, the frame, and it literally uncapped a whole strip of capping. Now I'm very careful, all the way down, and that's it, and it's done. And if I couldn't get in the top, I'll just pull that bit off. So I now have lots of liquid honey all the way around the frame and all on that frame, 
or this side of the frame was actually unpacked, but I have checked, and there is the honey is right, and it's not going to be too liquid, so we're not going to have lots of water in the honey. And I put that in my extractor. Um, are we are we all good at your end? Be, be nice yeah. if you could come off mute and just occasionally just say hello. Yeah, sorry, it's it's ge very just like jerky if you know what I mean at the moment. That's interesting because we've got a good good Wi-Fi connection at this end, so that's interesting. Okay, yeah. that's nice. Right. I'll just um, check the servers. I'm glad it's not. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, hopefully the recording will be good. We will we'll see, absolutely. So I do it again. Now this time I'm going to use an uncapping knife for it. I break the frame out. And this one, I've got better cappings all across. It's emptier there where the bees haven't quite filled it. But all through the rest of this, it's got nice cappings on it. And this we are spring honey, and I haven't yet tasted it yet. So the perks of the extractor will be to check its quality, and it's very much a process of uh, working through. I run my supers. I start with 11 or 12 frames uh, on the super box, and as they get older, the second year I'll run 10, and then I'll run nine or eight. So the wax gets bigger, and I have less frames, so I have less to extract in terms of capping. And I find the bees really don't mind. This is a media experience, isn't it? It is. That's really right. So I'm literally going to now run the knife, zigzag back up. If you use a knife, you'll need to clear the cappings off. I don't heat the knife at all. I don't wet it. You don't want any water on your extraction because water and honey don't mix. They start the process of fermentation. And so the last thing you want to do is to put any water on any of your equipment. Everything should be foam and dry. <laughs> so, every time you cut using the extraction knife, you'll get a load of cappings mm -hmm. on the knife. So you'll need to clear the cappings just using the bottom of the frame. And I have now done a complete size. Nice and easy. And I work and do exactly the same on the other side. And I'm going to literally run up the, the frame. So you need a steady hand for this. You need a steady hand. All you need to steady is onto your capping tray, if you can. And, and I, if I have a very heavy tray, or I've been doing this all day. For the first year, you can do this up against the, against the woodwork. But later years, then you've got to have a, a steady hand. And, and it weighs too much. <laughs> the frame is super. With, wax, with, with honey, it's about two pounds, two, two and a half pounds. By the time you've got the thick ones, they're four pounds, five pounds. And I can't lift that. Okay. So I've done this, that one. And if you find a couple of cells that aren't quite uncapped, use your uncapping fork to make sure that you've got everything sorted out. Okay. And that then goes into my extractor. Yeah, the one thing you do need to do is, like you say, get every 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 um, cell uncapped because otherwise you it doesn't extract in the extraction and, and leaves it leaves it all wobbly and then. And that's a lovely honey. I can tell you. <laughs> I try and keep myself clean and free from honey, so I've actually luckily got a water supply nearby. So I will try and constantly keep myself clean. I obviously wash my hands. You aren't dealing with honey, a food process, so everything should be food grade, stainless steel or plastic for your tools. No tin crate extractors squeeze. And of course, please make sure that uh, the surfaces you, you had, if you put honey on them, stay clean. If you do spill honey, scrape it up and put it in a pot and give it back to the bees. They're appreciative. The, the so best floor that covering that I have found. Uh, yeah, the best floor covering I've found is newspaper. Yep. Or and newspaper does work, you can throw it away afterwards. I've got a tiled floor, so I, I always know that by the time I finish my extraction, it will have little blobs of wax on it, and I'll be sticky. That's fine. Are there any questions so far on unpacking the frames? Well, 
something I was going to ask. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone out of my head. How long to yeah. uh, one super? How long one super uh, takes for you to uncap and spin? How long? Um, if I'm doing a super, I, I normally do, I, I, I won't do more than 10 supers at a go, but that's because I've got lots of bees. It takes me, I, I, it depends on the size of your extractor, how long it works, but I reckon it takes about three to four minutes a frame to uncap them and put them in the extractor. And of course, if you only have a three frame extractor, you've then got the spin. And depending on the size of the extractor, will depend on how long you have to spin for. Because obviously if it's got a bigger radius, it gets more force and the honey will fall out quicker. Mm. And it also depends on how sticky the honey is. If you wait and it is going a bit gloopy and thick, or if it's rape or anything like that, it can take a long time. And you have to be very, very careful of the balance and the spinning. Because if you spin honey and it's a tangential, what does it mean by tangential? The frames go in flat yes, yes, to the yeah. thinner. If you spin them too quickly, you can blow out the wax and the wax will then fall apart. So you can't spin them quickly. And you have to actually take the frames out and turn them around yes. and put them in the other way. This extractor I've got here is actually a radial extractor, which means that the, that the frames are all pointing to the center of the spinner. Yes. And you change the, 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 the direction of spin to get the honey out of the inside of the frames. So you notice I have uncapped both sides of the frame before I put it in the extractor. Um, yep. I will go through the process of spinning the honey, but I would, uh, before we do that, I'll actually talk through what you're doing. When you, so, so just summarise, yeah. that's about so 10 frames. 10 frames. Say, say three minutes each, so half an hour to actually take the cappings off. Probably, if, the, yeah, if, if, you're, if you're a beginner, yeah. it'll, take you, it'll take me a quarter of an hour, but yeah. take, uh, yeah, I've been doing it a few years. 15, 30 minutes to, to take the cappings off, pop it in the extractor. If the extractor takes the whole super, then what's that, another 15 minutes to take the honey off? I reckon that, well, it takes right. me about two to three minutes, um, but no, about five minutes of spinning to get most of the honey off. <laughs> I'm not rigorous at getting the every last bit of honey off the frames because I know that as soon as I've got the honey off I'm going to put the supers back on the bees and they'll clean them out and put it back into the next super so I don't have to be rigorous in getting all the honey out of the frames. When you're going to be spinning you'll start spinning slowly and by slowly I mean literally it's just going round until you can start to see the honey falling out of the frames. And your, soup, your, your spinner might well be unbalanced. And you have this lovely process of you hanging on to your extractor while it's spinning, <laughs> if you've got an electric one, or if someone else is turning it, you're holding on to it because it is unbalanced. We're going to, so, we're going to see that. We will in a minute, because <laughs> the frames have a different amount of honey in them. And so it's one of those processes. If you have only got a small number of frames, do put empty frames in the other slots to try and balance up and also move the heavy ones so they're almost opposite each other and that helps a little bit. The super, when you, when you spin the honey out, I tend to spin a little bit one way and then stop and spin a bit the other way and then I go faster and then faster the other way. It's the whole purpose of I'm trying to make sure that the, soup, the, the wax doesn't get deformed and I gently get as much honey as possible. If you throw the honey to the sides of the extractor really quickly, you're gonna get more air in your honey and you'll get more air bubbles in the honey in the bucket. And if it was almost ready to start crystallizing, those air bubbles will start the crystallization process really quickly. I'm glad I'm doing these tests because I've never, never, never realised that. But the faster you get the honey off, the better. Well, yeah, the yeah, you yeah, can do it. Yeah, then, that's then not good. Get, no. Then you get these extra try, with air bubbles. Try and be gentle with your honey, that's for sure. And the other thing will be is you need to have a way of taking the honey out of the extractor because it will fill up. And some
some people have only got a small number of supers will be able to get all their honey in the extractor before they start extracting out. I actually have a double fizz, a stainless steel double fizz, that sits underneath the honey tap. That will catch, the course uh, will catch the capping that uh, come off the frame, and the fine will get all the last bits and pieces. So I double fizz all my honey before it goes into buckets. Food grade sealable buckets, again, because you want to stop air getting in your honey once you've finished. Air, honey is hydroscopic, it sucks in moisture. And so once it starts to suck in moisture, it will start to ferment on the surface. The action of fermenting actually creates more water as it breaks down the, the uh, honey. And so it then becomes a self-sustaining process. And we're aiming at, I think the actual figure is eight. 2.4% or less, but I actually want to name at 18% or less water in my honey. How do I know that? I'll show you later. So you need buckets and a sieve, I suggest, to be able to get your honey out of the extractor. Right, Colin, I want to see you what you Okay, doing. here we go. So I'm now going to start thinning, and because I don't have a manual one, it's nice and easy. Quite noisy. <laughs> I've got a little wobble, but it's quite good. Maybe try and do that with a manual one. It does uh, <laughs> yeah, we got a wobble, wobble a lot. And you see, actually, today, it's not even moving. Sometimes I'm dancing around with it, hanging on to it for dear life. Oh, it's a little rattle. While it's doing that, I have remembered my question. You, you said that um, in year one you use 11 or 12 uh, frames in your super and then year two you'll have one less and then down to 10. Um, but the bees don't mind. Why do you do that? Is that just to save you work? That's right. I mean, will the, bees, will the bees fill up the remaining frames more fully? Or they not? will <laughs> fill up. The, because there's more space between the frames, they will draw out the foundation and put more honey in each of the frames. Oh, okay. And of course, as you take the cappings off, if you take le less cappings off over the whole super, you'll lose less honey. And so it's, I find the bees, if the bees are well behaved and they produce very nice uh, uh, honey, even honey, then I just find it easier for me and the bees. And I get more honey per super. Yeah. Because yeah, there's woodwork stored in the frame. And yeah. of course, okay. it, it's one of those things where it does mean that I just have to have less frames and I always need to run out of equipment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that seems, yeah. Okay, so we, that, that's one spin from one side and I've got honey now. Actually, it's filled the whole bottom of the extractor. So I'm actually now opening up the honey pad and it's pouring out. You probably can't see that, but... Uh, you can see the honey pouring out the bottom. Uh, and I'll turn it down a bit so you can see. There's honey pouring out the bottom. Oh, I think. You can if it zooms in. Social distancing. And if I've got nine frames in the extractor, oh, I find I'll that, get yeah. about. And this honey is just about right. It, it, it isn't too gloopy. Um, you can tell it it's gloopy because it starts to come out in little white crystallized lumps. And so obviously in the cells, the uh, honey starts to crystallize. If you come across a frame, that honey won't come out of, and it's solid, the only thing you can really do is then give it back to the bees. And you've got two choices. Let them seal it up again and fill it up with honey. Or you can wet it, put it in a bucket of water, and that hopefully they'll then chew it back, because they will want to reduce the water content again. But my suggestion is, don't try and extract honey which is solid, because you're wasting your time. It's hard work. 
How many pa- how many pounds? Stop the noise at that point there, and I'll keep walking. How many, how, many pounds? Pounds of, how many pounds of honey did you say you'd guess it went, um, it went off when you said that? Okay. Um, uh, I find a super of extraction would normally give me about 25 pounds of honey. So that's one uh-huh. complete big bucket of honey per super that's a good on average. That's a good crop. That, if all the fragrance were full. That's a good 10 kilos in new money. Yeah. And so... I always warn people, watch out when you're lifting these supers off. If you stack them up nice and high, the beekeeper's back and the pain of lifting, you really will know about it. So the honey extractions, and I've only put in snow frames there, and I've now got about a quarter of a bucket, and I haven't spun it past yet. But there's no point in me spinning it while you're watching it, because we're trying to learn about all the bits and pieces. Well, what I will do is emphasize to you about water content. Um, many of you won't have the benefit of a, a refractometer. They cost about 30 pounds to buy. You can get one on the internet and sell it in a nice beekeeping shop near you called Box House Beekeeping. <laughs> I sell for 28 pounds 50 I sell them for, so it's quite good. But these I find a really, really useful tool because I'll get a little dipping stick and I'll take a quick dip of the honey that's coming off. And I put the honey, whoops, the dripping on it, on the little glass plate. And you only need a drop of honey. You don't need much, you see. You can put much on there. Anyway. The benefits of this straight away are yeah, it's uh, a very nice honey. Definitely honey. Definitely honey. <laughs> uh, what I should do, of course, I'm being very mean. The fact that um, you can't taste it. But so I'll give it a camera map. Oh, now, what do, you, what do you think of it? I think I need more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. No, yeah, nice, honey. You drop the flap back on the honey, and then I can't see it if I put the glasses up. So I then look, and that one tells me it's about 17.8%, but it's very blurry. I've got a bit of wax in there. I tend not the readings out of the. It'd be very difficult to do that, I think. It won't work. Yeah, I'll um, see an upside down there video. I would say is don't try and take your readings straight away. Yeah. The, the reading of a refractometer will give you a very blurry line when you just take it out straight away. Let the bucket settle first. I normally leave it 24 hours. The honey is heavier than the water, so the water will rise up the top of the water. Oh, when you test it then, you get a much clearer result of what we oh. should be done. Yeah, Feedback system. Now, I've got a very bad habit now <laughs> of cleaning my refractometer, so no one else should use my refractometer because I clean it off and dry it out. So, that told me straight away the honey was actually quite dry, but I wouldn't be testing it until later. If you do have a bucket of honey and you find that when you've finished and you've done a check of the water content and it's above 18.5, don't panic. The bees know how to get rid of the water. All they do is they leave it uncapped and fan and let the moisture, have a, they have a warm hive and the moisture will drive itself off before they cap it. You do the same thing. You can either go into put it into a closed room that's warm and put a fan and blow air across it. Uh, I cheat and I actually have a little dehumidifier that I got and I can find that if I run a dehumidifier in a closed room with a fan that's blowing across the honey bucket, I can reduce water content by about half a percent a day. And so if it's wet honey, I can blow off the wet honey and we will then reduce the content. There is nothing worse than you keeping a bucket that's wet because what will happen is it will start to froth. And it either will froth in the bucket or froth when you put it into the jars. And then you'll have fermenting honey and it will ruin the whole bucket. And once it starts to ferment, you have a real challenge. Trying to stop fermentation is hard work. It can be done, 
but it's hard work. What you tend to have to do is heat the honey up fairly quickly, and any heating of the honey will change its flavor. So I always try and say, is, please do a minimum amount of heating as possible. Obviously, if you want liquid honey, you'll have to warm the honey up to a point where the honey melts. But with storing honey, you'll store it in sealed buckets. The bucket should be full to about an inch from the top and then thick sealed and that will then last indefinitely. Do please write on the bucket which apiary it came from, what the weight of the bucket is, what the water content is of the bucket so that you can remember and I tend to find that I keep my honey for actually a year if I can if you've got honey that's very, very strong tasting, um, say it comes from ragwort or it comes from uh, one of the uh, unusual plants grown in your neighbourhood and you don't like the honey because it's quite astringent, it's quite bitter, honey matures after time it's kept in the bucket and you'll find that the tastes become more rounded the longer you leave it. Marathon has never guessed to last that long. So, uh, <laughs> the other thing I would also suggest is if you've only got one or two hives, don't extract it all in one go. Because the bees will fill the supers up, the frames, from the centre to the outside. If you pick up each of your frames and hold it up to the light, you'll notice that there'll be different colours. And obviously, it will depend if you've only got two supers or one super. Extract the centre one first and keep it separate. So you pour it into a small bucket or to a small jar and then do the ones that have got the same colour. Hold it up to light and then you can extract the two outer ones. You'll find the taste difference is amazing. Because your bees will have been uh, gathering and foraging off different plants and flowers and you get a chance to taste all the different varieties of the nectar and the mixture of pollens with them. I take my honey off three times a year because I can then guarantee I will get a true spring honey and I'll get a true early summer honey and I'll get a true late summer honey. Honey gets a stronger flavour as your year goes on because the lighter elements have evaporated off, you get more sunshine on them and you tend to find it gets stronger honey from trees. Yeah, the lime, the chestnut, gives you a much bolder flavour. Are there any questions or any comments to make on that? You said you get much stronger honey from what? I missed what you said. From uh, trees, from did you say trees? in the year. So if I, yeah. Take, yeah, if I take spring honey, it tends to be light floral and tends to be very fine grain honey. Summer honey tends to be slightly darker. It has a more complex flavour and it has a more honey flavour actually, it, it doesn't taste as sweet and then if you ever take honey off in August and September you'll find that that honey is really bold, it's strong and it's darker often because it's got ivy in it as well but all the different honeys have different flavours depending on what your bees have been foraging on in the Suffolk area we tend to get a lot of blackberry in the summer and you'll tend to find that that has a lovely rounded flavour. Um, if you're near to woodland, at this time of the year, the bees have just finished foraging on, on the chestnut, because their flowers are just going over. Again, a very nice honey. The, another couple of weeks and they'll be on the field beans. Unfortunately, this year, I think the weather's going to be so dry that you're going to get not much nectar off the field beans. But if it's a, a damp summer and the field beans are wet, you get a really rich Delightful flavoured honey. I think lime is about to flower now, isn't it? Lime is about now. I I, I, I very uh, flavours of uh, honey. I've got one. Uh, I'm just about to cream, and that honey has got a really dominant light, uh, a citrus flavour to it. And you either like it or you don't. But I have a problem is if people come to my door and say I really love the honey I had last time, can I have it again? The answer was. I'm sorry, but the next batch of honey will be different and it will be based on what the bees were taking. I, I do batch up my honey so that if I can, I can guarantee that people get the same uh, <laughs> hive and the same extraction. But it, it, once it's gone, it's gone, type of thing. Are there any other questions? I've got a question on 
clearing. Sorry if I missed it earlier. Um, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, say I've got two supers on a hive, uh, the top one is full, ready to extract. Do I put the crown board with the porter escapes between those two and leave the top super open uh, to clear the bees? Uh, what I normally do is I have an extra crown, uh, uh, crown board if I was going to clear. So I'll leave the crown board on the top. I will put the clearer board between the full super and the empty super, making sure I've got it the right way round, and then the bees go down into the empty super um, to do it. You tend, most people tend to put the full supers up and put the empty super underneath yep. the uh, full supers uh, because the bees want the shortest distance to travel to where they're filling up. Actually, that was a, a good point you made about the you know, clearer board. You really do want to put it on the right way up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You put it on the upside down. It's a one-way valve. It's a one-way valve and it really doesn't work. But I, I think you, you take it for granted but it's not obvious. In, in, not the, first time. No. So, um, the other thing I would say is that don't be worried. If you want to do a little bit of extraction for yourself, but there isn't much honey there, don't take it all. We in this area have a period, if you take it in May, and then we have a very severe June gap where there is no nectar coming in, and the bees have got lots of young, they've got to feed them on something, and they can starve. And so don't be a, a mean beekeeper and take all the honey off in the spring. The same goes through in the summer. Don't be a uh, mean beekeeper and take it all from them. They need something. But you might also want to think about, have they actually been filling up, they filled up their brood box with honey? Because I have often had to go to a, a hive where it took a little while to expand out and they have put all the spring honey in the brood box. Yeah, tell me about that. And you can't leave it there because they will run out of room for the brood and their little swarm. So you might actually have to take the brood frames out and extract those as well. And I have got some brood frames I've got to later extract today because they are absolutely full of honey. They certainly should have one frame of stores on each side of the brood in the brood box. But if they've got two or three, that's too much. So what I suggest you do is you leave the one that's got the pollen on it because that will be the one on the inside of the brood stores. And the outer one, literally take them out, put empty frames back in there and extract them, spin them out as if you had a super, if it fits in your extractor. And sometimes that's a problem. If it won't fit in your extractor, perhaps you're gonna to have to do uncapping and leave it in a warm room. You, know, you uncap one side and put it in the conservatory. And if the honey is liquid, it hasn't actually solid solidified, it will over a time, if you put it on a, a cake cooling tray, it will sit there and drain out. Don't put it on something that isn't supported because you'll find you'll have a big dome of wax and it will all fall into the bottom of your tray. Yeah. So, so just, yeah, I've got one, one point there about the, um, if we've got, uh, <clears throat> do you remember Ipswich Lee Suffolk beekeepers, which I think the majority of people here are, um, the association extractor, I've got a little thing that goes in so that you can take out um, yes. 14 by 12 frames yes. uh, radially. This is what you like that. No, this is what we talked about. Yeah. So, okay, I've got one here for you. So this one has nine frames radially, but I can put a very big uh, rack in it and I can now spin out three 14 by 12 frames, but I only can do one side at a time but it does work really well and I will be doing that later today so that my bees have got room in the brew box because if you don't have room in the brew box you will have a swarm and you don't have the bees and you don't have the bees to look after it so it is something you have to remember are there any other questions I know that we had a big June gap last year it was a big June gap last year and that's the first one I've ever had I'm expecting a big June gap this year because we have uh, already been told that the blackberry is starting to think about flowering. And usually the June gap ha happens when your tree nectar, early tree nectar, your chestnut is finished, and you then have a gap waiting for the blackberry to flower. Because black 
green flowers normally mid, -ju mid to end June, all the way through to August. And this year, it's going to come very early. We've had very, very warm weather. And I have a feeling we're going to have shorter June gap, have a second gap in, in, the, in, the, in the flow. I don't know if you've been looking at your bees, but my bees have certainly slowed down their, their production. We had a burst of enthusiasm probably last week when they were bringing in huge amounts of nectar. And now, just over the last couple of days, it has eased off, primarily for the fact that it hasn't been any rain and moisture. And so the only thing that gives lots of nectar is usually trees. So all the hedgerows are very dry at the moment and they haven't really grown much. Um, if you've got people who are really good at watering their gardens, then you might find that you'll get um, some very nice raspberry or very nice bean um, flow. Um, you tend to find the honey bees don't tend to like lavender, the, the bubble bees are on those. But if push comes to shove, the bees will become adept at finding nectar from almost anything. So are you saying that if there is likely to be a June gap or there's going to be some problems like that, it's going to be more of a problem for people in rural areas rather than urban areas? It, it, yes, it depends on whether you've got woodland near you. If you've got woodland, uh, we, we are lucky, I do have woodland nearby. And if the trees have stopped flowering, what, if the oaks have got um, aphids on them, then we get a lot of honeydew. And literally, it's the secretions of the aphids that the bees go and then lick off and bring it back. And oddly enough, that's quite a nice honey. So it's just slightly different in flavour. So it's nice to know. Now, you might ask, how do I know what my bees are on? Well, you, the best and easiest way to do it is look at the colour of the pollen as the bees are going in and out of the hive. And there are colour charts that should give you an indication of what the bees are foraging on at the time. Uh, the other thing you'll start to get experience of, if you ask someone like Barry, uh, 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 and uh, he knows the taste of uh, the honey, he can actually say, oh, that is a particular uh, thing. It uh, could, oh, be Barry Powell. Barry Powell. Not you, you're not Barry, you. Yeah, he, <laughs> well, you, we could ask you. Might you look be it's a that you don't know what it is. I only know a few of them at the moment. I, I don't have the, the knowledge of exactly what it is, but it's definitely worthwhile having go at learning the different tastes if you're extracting because you'll get to know some of the flavours that come in. And if your uh, customers who come and buy you, your friends and family who come and ask you about your honey, and say, what's in it? You can do some sort of pollen analysis. So literally, you get some honey, put it into water, then you have to either spin it out or wait for it to settle out, and you put the pollen grains that are left at the bottom of the... Uh, the, the onto a microscope slide, and you open up a book that's got all the different pollen grains on, and you can actually see what the bees have put in the honey. There's, a, there's another um, thing there, it's a fabulous advert for the, I think it's the CEH. Um, yeah. This is the, the Centre for something in hydrology, where they're asking beekeepers to give them samples of, of honey. Yes, so you basically right. take it straight out of the super, um, and they will take the samples and analyse it, do some DNA analysis and tell you the range of um, different types of pollen that have been in, been in that honey. Um, if you just go to the CEH website, um, register, they don't, they can't send kits out at the moment, but they're, they're telling you to just take some take some honey off, about 200 ml of honey, straight off the super, basically cut it out of the super, pop it in a jar, keep it sealed, and if you've registered, they'll send you some vials to put this honey in, and then you can get it an analysed. That's right, and they'll, they'll obviously, obviously looking to see whether there's persistent chemicals left in the honey. Um, I, I, I participated in a, a sample last year, and um, it was very useful. They said it was mixed uh, foraging. They gave me what the foraging was, and they said no residue whatsoever. And so you could uh, smile and say, well done, bees. But you, you never know whether a gardener nearby has been spraying his roses or whatever else, and the bees been on the nectar. Um, certainly, you yourselves should know that you haven't treated your bees with any chemicals while the honey flow is on. So no thymol based products, be it real varroa, um, and all the treatment, main treatments are done after you've done your extraction of honey. Once we've done the extraction, remember you've got wet supers. You need to put these supers back on the hive. You don't have to put them 
under or over other supers. What I tend to find is if the bees have got plenty of space and the supers are on the hive, I will tend to put the supers above the crown board. So the bees will crawl through and lick out the wet supers and make them dry again. It takes about a day, two days to do that. But they won't have the extra space so they spread the honey that they're gathering across all the supers. Because what you want to do is to try and keep them so that they are concentrated in one area. The second thing is the more supers you have on the hive, the hive will get cooler because they have to heat all that area up to make it warm. So if you actually only put on the boxes that you need, so I often might put the supers on to get them licked out on, above the crown board and then literally take them off and put them back into my store waiting for when I need them again. So you put... So when you the supers put... get them licked out, Oh, there's a question. Yes, so Paul, you, you, you come back with your uh, super uh, emptied of honey, you put a crown bar and you put your super, super empty and you put another crown bar and they will lick it, yes? That's what you meant. Um, I, I, tend to put a, I, I tend to just put the super on top of the crown bar underneath the roof without an extra crown board on. And so okay. literally, and I might put two or three on I always will check, I, I will write on my supers in chalk where they came from and I put them back on the same hive. What I, I think you should do is try and prevent any carryover of disease between hives. Put them back on the same hive and therefore they can lick out their own honey. And that's why I said I'm not too precious about spinning absolutely every drip of honey out because I know that they will do a far better job than I will at cleaning out the super. And I also know that if I put a wet super on a hive, that will invigorate the whole hive. You tend to find that they get really excited and they do work and they go out and get more honey. And so if it's in the honey flow season, if I put a wet super on, I tend to find that all the bees are animated and I can come back and find that the super is that was underneath, it's full with far more than I have just put on it. In the fact, they've worked harder because they think honey flow has started again, it's going. And so very much, if you want to increase the speed and work rate of your bees, put a bit of honey on the top and off they go. <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> um, what do you do with your, unca your cappings that are in your tray there? Okay, uncap the capping. So I've got, I've got a very little tray here, but usually it's stacked full. And I have my camera and spin around because I've got just a tray with a grid on it. And I will put those on this. And literally, it will be sitting there, dripping away. And I'll have to do this six or seven times in the, in the extraction process. So they'll be sitting there waiting to go. And that honey that's sitting in this basically a, a, a filter tank, I will leave for 24 to 48 hours to keep on dripping. And that will then, I will put it into a bucket called cold cap, capping honey. And because it hasn't been spun out, you'll find it will have a slightly different flavor to the honey you've spun out. And cold cap honey is lovely, it tastes nice. It, it, oddly enough, it, 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 it is, if you ever want to have wax that is perfect for candles, Capping's wax is the nicest you can get. And so don't waste it. Once I have my Capping's dried off, I've actually got from the car boots a wax, a, 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 slow, a slow cooker. Okay. And this slow cooker I've got on the lowest setting possible. And I will put it on and I will warm it up. And what will happen is that the honey will drop, any honey that's left over will drop to the bottom. And the wax cappings, I won't actually try and melt them. I'll just have them as semi-melted. And that, I then let the cool and I will pour that off. And you'll find that that also will produce quite a lot of honey. Check, check it, make sure you haven't cooked the honey but I'll keep that separately and that will be my reserve for feeding back to the bees if I need to later on. I tend not to uh, have that as honey I sell, but you can do it, it tastes lovely. And then finally, 
I will then heat it to a higher temperature to get the wax ready, and I will pour the wax through some hestian into big stainless steel moulds I've got, and I'll have wax blocks. And that is probably the nicest wax that you'll ever get. If you want nice scented candles, if you want to uh, use it in beeswax polishes, Capping's wax is the nicest of the wax that you, you can have. So don't ever throw it away, keep it, because it's a, it's a nice wax. And you'll find you'll get an awful lot of wax. And even if you don't want it, bring it back to your supplier and he will swap it for foundation. There is a, a, a direct exchange. So if you have a pound of uh, beeswax in a block, you can actually have seven or eight, nine, I can't remember what the exchange rate is, it's on the website. I, I do exchanges as well, and you can have free wax foundation back, and that way the foundation is then passed back to the bee processors, and they are then able to make more foundation. So don't waste your wax good. and use it in uh, later on. Are there any other questions? <laughs> okay. You said something. Now, you said. Hang on, there we go. Uh, you said something earlier about it. Uh, sometimes the bees will put the spring honey into the into the brood onto the brood frame, yeah. and um, it 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 just cut off when you said about um about what would happen if you took some. I don't know what you took out, but you said the bees will swarm, and I thought, what will happen if? Uh, uh, why will the bees okay. swarm? And I missed the bit in the middle. <laughs> okay, the, the the key thing is if the brood box gets full up with honey, called blocking out the, the, the frame, the queen can't lay more eggs. And at the moment when she runs out of space to lay eggs, the bees get That's frustrated and decide that, right then, we need to prepare to swarm. And so the extra honey in the brew box is not a good idea. Um, honey bound, isn't it? Honey bound, yes, indeed. So. so what I suggested was take out the ones that have got honey in and leave just two frames for stores, and those stores frames should be the ones that have got the honey and the pollen on. And you'll find that the inner ones will generally be the ones that you leave. And you put them to the outside of the brood pattern. And if necessary, put some nice clean frames or spin out the brood frames and put them back into the box. They will clean them up, tidy them up, and they'll be happy again. It's only right. the fact that they, they had so much space and it was easier for them to put in the brood box rather than carry it up to the super. Sometimes they yeah. don't like drawing new wax in the super and will just fill up their brood box. So when you, when you actually spin it out, you've got all the brood that's um, not, you know, that's not, um, obviously, um, the, no, no, no. the brood comes out, out into the... the... Yes. Right. How would you so, recover? Well, I should tell you, you, recover the caveat, you only spin out the frame. Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. First. You only spin out the frames that are just honey. Never ever spin out the frames that have got brood on them. Okay. So, and you yeah. will see that if they've got a crescent of honey in them and they've got brood, leave it alone. The only frames we're talking about are the ones where they've actually filled the whole frame up with honey. Oh, okay. Right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. No brood. <laughs> yeah. And that's the no brood, yeah. Yeah. And, you, and yeah. You, don't, yeah, you won't have to do this unless you've got more than two frames of you know, honey in the brood box. And most of you will never have this in your whole life. But no. I have known it in several hives especially if you have commercial or 14 by 12 boxes. So they're bigger boxes and they've got more space. They have the tendency to be a bit lazy, especially if there is a very good honey flow. So if the honey pouring in really quickly and the young bees haven't got enough time to carry it up the super, they will put it into the brood box and leave it there. And that's why we're okay. trying to say you have to spin it out. Oh, I'm glad I asked the question then, because I missed most of that, because it went off. <laughs> I lost the uh, connection, yeah, thanks. Okay. okay. I think that's almost about it, unless there are any other questions, um, we should yeah. call it a halt at that point there. I believe that we will be putting this on, uh, on the website so that you'll actually be able to watch it again, and hopefully you can tell your friends that it should be without any of these delays, but we
we, we, we'll find out when it's been recorded. We don't have any of these. Delays. Oh, the delays. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.